great to see you again this afternoon. Um, I absolutely love that moment with Andrew Garrahy at the last session talking about DD. It always strikes me that people and humans can do extraordinary things, but often people don't do extraordinary things. Um, and it's difficult to understand why, but I think one of the reasons is that particularly in businesses, businesses don't have soul. We've talked a lot today about culture, about motivating people. So I'm very glad today we've got two experts um, in soul. Uh, we've, first of all, we've got Ralph Speck, who is the creator of the soul system. And I said that in, in true sort of Graham Norton style, I'm going to hand up, to, hand up, show two of his books. Here we are. Uh, absolutely well worth buying. Uh, Building Corporate Soul, which we're going to be talking a lot about today and then beyond the startup and uh, you'll hear a little bit about uh, Ralph's story as we go through um, but also we've got Adrian Hallmark and Adrian I want to say thank you to you because you were at Jaguar Land Rover yes and and we've also got Ian Armstrong here who was also there at the time and for years I really wanted a Jaguar F-Type <laughs> And I kept thinking about it. And Peter Carey, my old business partner, is here. We kept talking about it. And then finally this year, I wasn't very well at the beginning of the year, and my, and my sister said, Kasuki, this is the moment to buy the car that you've always wanted. So I now have a beautiful car in my driveway that I drive to work every day or to, to the station. And so thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for inspiring me through the brand. Uh, <laughs> good to, to it's good that. to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be bad. Um, Adrian, let's let's start with you because you're you know you've done a transformation job. We've been ta we're talking all day about transformation, but um, you know as chairman and chief exec of Bentley Motors, you've been on that kind of radical transformation journey, mm -hmm. um, and the change and the culture that you put into the organisation, you say, is is really part of what has made that happen. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, um, thanks for having me here. First of all, um, our story is quite an interest, interesting one. We're 102 years old. Um, and we've been reasonably successful for most of those years. But in 2018, when I arrived, we were in a pretty terrible state. Couldn't build cars, and we had the biggest loss in the company's history. So um, we activated the organization. And the first step was to understand where we were and then tell the truth. Um, and I did my so-called, it's a broken business speech, and then repeated it and repeated it. Um, and after the first presentation, where we stopped the factory, got everybody together, um, a bunch of guys and girls came up at the end and said, that was fantastic. We've known it for the last two years. Um, and to hear it from you is fantastic. Don't worry, we can fix it as well. So they knew how to fix it? That's what they said. Did so, they? So that's what we allowed them to do, yeah. Um, so it was really, well, first of all, be honest. Yeah. And be, be fair, yeah. uh, you know, don't exaggerate but then invite people to participate and keep inviting them and then implement uh, the things that, you, that they come up with as fast as possible. Uh, you've got to have a plan and a strategy as well, but if you don't engage every single person in defining the problem, defining the solution and driving it to conclusion, then you end up with this gap between the board's view, the management's view, and what it really feels like to be in the company. Yeah, and I, I'm always fascinated by factories, and, and actually, mm. in some ways, the difference between you and them yeah. is quite a big gap in many ways. Yeah. How, and we talk about it, but what, did, what tangible things did you do? Uh, well, many, um, and some of them sound superficial, but they're not. Um, the first thing, stop the line, and we spent, well, I spent a week on the line myself, working in different areas. Then we stopped the line and took every single area of activity, 52 stations around the long production system, uh, and got everybody in, every function from around the company, what's not working, what's working, what do we need to fix, and generated 991 problems in building one car. Um, and then got rid of all of them within four months, um, and then constantly improved. So it's all about not, not just doing the broken business speech, but then turning that into detailed, tangible action, keep selling the vision and the purpose, but make sure that you give people chance to say what's wrong, yeah. help to find a solution, and then implement constantly at the, small, at the low level, then the top level, and just keep communicating. And communication through COVID was incredible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was the key for us. 
That's really interesting. That kind of sense of momentum. Mm. You know, I, I, we hear it time and time again. We've heard it today, but uh, yep. you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Um, Ralph, your book, Building Corporate Soul. Yes. Why did you think you needed to write a book? Where did this come from, and what is Corporate Soul? Well, the inspiration from for for the book came from tens, hundreds of emails from from colleagues when I left my uh, position as CEO of Spark 44, so a company that Adrian was a founding partner and Ian was our main client. And as I was the last of the founding partners that left the business, um, people felt the need not to just simply say farewell, but to also take stock of the, of the culture we had built. There was a fear that, that this would get lost moving forward with the founding partners being gone. And um, I mean, there's, there's a few of these statements in, uh, in the book. And it felt to me like what we had built was not just the legacy of 1,200 people, 18 offices, and all, all of that, and, and some great work, good to be bad, mm -hmm. um, but actually a company with soul. And um, I was thinking about, uh, should, should I leave this on my iPhone, or should I actually tell the world? And I decided to tell the world and uh, create my vision of making soulless companies a thing of the past. And I love that expression, making soulless companies a thing of the past, because it sounds so obvious, but actually it's really hard, isn't it, Adrian? And, and you know, I like, I'm going to read it because I want to get it right. In shared purpose, so there's kind of three areas in the book, shared purpose, uh, shared understanding and shared behavior. And we're going to just quickly go through all three of those. So shared purpose is why am I here and why are we here? So Adrian, if, if you answered those questions for yourself, maybe as you've gone through that transformation, why were you there and why were they there? And why are you? Um, it's changed. Yeah. Um, so why am, why am I here? Um, I, I went back to Bentley. I'd been there before, left 15 years ago. I was board member of sales and marketing then, came back, invited to be the chairman CEO, CEO, and my purpose for being there was to electrify the brand and transform it for the next generation. Um, having got there and seen what I found, um, all priorities shifted away from lofty, philosophical, long-term purpose goals into survival, mm -hmm. but then very quickly, you have to have a long-term plan. So my, my personal purpose now is to make sure that when I step away from this business, that it's in a position where the team own it, yeah. they own the plan, they own the purpose of the company. Anyone else coming in almost should be able to sit back and enjoy the ride. And that we set a momentum that is difficult to stop in terms of shifting the brand, the design, the technology, the financial performance level that we achieve and make the strongest luxury company in the world. It's biggest by volume, but it's nowhere near the strongest financially. Yeah. And I think we need both, um, and that's my purpose. And then I can rest peacefully on the beach somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I, I think when you said at the beginning in 2018 you made the biggest loss that you made, mm. you kind of go, that's not a great, well in some ways it's a great place to start, isn't it? Yeah. But in other ways, you know, that, that's a big moment of going, okay, this is a real challenge. Um, Ralph, why did you pick those questions? Why, why is that so important when companies are looking at having a sense of soul? Well, <clears throat> you could differentiate between culture and soul, right? So every company has got a culture. You can't have a company without culture, um, but only some have got soul. And when they've got soul, they have managed the integrity of the strategic intent, the purpose, okay. and the vision, mission, values, and spirit, and the behaviors that actually happen inside the company. And so when you're starting with purpose, and I've uh, called it shared purpose um, for a reason, because similar to what Adrian has done uh, at, at Bentley, sharing the purpose is critical with the leadership team. And very often that's just not really happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's even more important uh, to, to share it with everyone inside the company from top to bottom and make sure everybody gets it. And when everybody gets it, uh, you, you have the, uh, the opportunity to build a company culture uh, with soul. You align vision, mission, values to it. I've added spirit because I think that is one aspect of culture that I think has got lost uh, too often. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, spirit is the intended culture. 
So like when Adrian joined uh, or rejoined uh, Bentley, one question was probably um, kind of how, how do we want this place to feel? And, um, and when you answer that question, when you have, an, have, a, have an answer on that question, you have the power to influence the behaviors because people can connect the two. That's very often very, very difficult with just values. Yes. Because he's a honesty. Yeah, perfect. <coughs> Who wants to be dishonest? <coughs> but what does it mean in the day-to-day -day dealings inside a company? Yeah. So when you were at Spark 44, because you, you know, ended up being quite a big global operation, mm -hmm. how were you doing that kind of shared purpose? How were you communicating it? So we talked earlier on today how important that is and getting that consistent message. Yeah, communication, communication, communication. Yeah. Uh, and, and it feels like you're repeating yourself um, very often. I mean, this was like 2011, 2012, so there was no Zoom. We had go-to meetings. Yeah. And whenever people joined, they were always surprised about that we were so technologically savvy uh, because they hadn't experienced this anywhere else. And um, because we had lots of people in remote places, like individuals that were running our agency in Japan. Mm -hmm. And our agency in Japan at that time was one person. And uh, they were lucky twice yeah. a year when I was coming around, and uh, they were lucky another two times a year when they were going to uh, a place for, for a meeting. But basically, they spent 98% uh, of the year on their own with that client. Really hard. And how do you build a connection and a culture with those people? And I think what we've been able to achieve was to code the experiences mm. um, and create experiences that went deep with them. And, and that allowed them uh, actually to build that connection. And technology and the Zoom calls or go to meetings uh, helped doing that. And as we increased the business and, and needed a significant uh, amount of new leaders, it was exactly those people who basically uh, learned the culture from the get-go yes. with the founders over the first three years. I, I love that, and you're so right. So often, if you can get that right and get the soul there, then you can encourage people to grow through an organization, yes. and that works so well. The second one is around shared understanding and believing. Um, you know, we often see that there's kind of this disconnect, don't we? We, you know, we talked briefly then about the difference between you as the leader and the, the factory floor. Should you have all have the same belief? Or do you have a slightly different belief at leadership level and they have a different belief that's right for them? How does that work? Um, I think that's the key, in my opinion. Um, and bridging that gap is critical. Yeah. So if, if I, and this is nothing to do with intellect, it's to do with the way people work. I think in the non-productive areas, uh, in the offices, let's call it, um, it's far more cerebral. Yeah. In the productive areas, it's far more environmental. So what do I mean? So uh, we've described our Beyond 100 strategy to go fully electric by 2030. So what does that mean for people who work in the factory? You'd think that was great. New investment in crew, two and a half billion, um, going fully electric, secure jobs, etc. So first thing, right, you're having a new paint shop. Yeah. So there's 600 people work there now. How many do you need for the new paint shop? 300. What's going to happen to our 300 colleagues? Mm. Or we build 12 cylinder engines today. We're not going to build them in X years time. What's going to happen to the 120, 30 people that work in there? Mm. And why aren't our rest areas as good as the people that work in the offices? So turning that all around, what we did straight away was said, right, we've got a purpose and a vision and where we want to be. What are your dreams? If you could draw the perfect factory for you to work and live in, what would it look like? How would it feel? What would it contain? Yeah. And we involved everybody in that process and we built the so-called dream factory. Everyone has described what they want to achieve. Everyone has described what they need to be able to achieve it. And we've created something which is incredible, including training pathways for all those people that are moving. So we, we keep banging on the press about beyond 100 electrification, blah, blah, blah. But down at the, yeah. the shop floor level, you get better rest areas. We're going to digitalize all these processes. There'll be less noise. There'll be air conditioning, um, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So it's all about turning it into reality for them and then keeping them positive and connected with the yeah. journey. So with those people that uh, won't be there, mm. so you know, they don't have a job, yep. and presumably you, know, you can't take everyone and then redeploy mm. them into the business, how do you deal with that? Because that's hard, isn't it? Well, actually, that was one of our biggest... Um, I can't call it success, mm. but from a cultural point of view, it's one of the most 
humbling things I've ever experienced when we had to let go 30% of our workforce uh, two years ago. So COVID hit, we shut the factory quickly, cut production by 40%, um, and put a scheme in place to lose uh, basically a thousand people. A um, the way it was done was incredible. Um, the way that management dealt with it, the way that they engaged with people, the package we put together, um, the way we created a job market so that people that volunteered to go, mm -hmm. people could apply for their roles if they were still valid in the new structure. We did retraining if they didn't fit the roles perfectly. In the end, we, we did lose 923 people. We didn't push for the last 77, because mm -hmm. it was academic almost. And of the 923 people, only four were compulsory redundancies. Wow. The rest were voluntary. And we re-deployed re, um, about 220 people through this internal job market. And HR, the legal team, every manager, the way they embraced it and cared for the people that were at risk and coached them through it and, and ran the process. You said about the spirit, as is, it's a, a family that's highly professional. Yeah. And you care for each other. You can argue as much as you want. But when it comes to it, you fight for each other too. Yeah. Even if it's in that negative situation. Yeah. And that's the spirit of the company. Did you lose the good people that you would have liked to have kept? Because one of the problems with losing that many people is that you actually, all the brilliant people can go and get another job leave and you get left yeah. with the dross. Not that I'm saying you've got any dross, but you know, does that happen? I call it the dolphin and the tuna net syndrome. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Or the other way around. Yeah. Um, no, they're all brilliant that we've got. Of course they are. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Ralph, <laughs> believing. Tell us, tell us from your perspective, from your learning, from all the people you've spoken to in the book, what is that disconnect? What are the key themes that you see in you know, great leaders like, like Adrian and they've done? Well, creating that narrative about the belief system um, is, is one of the most critical things. And, and very often that doesn't exist. Um, and, and I mean, in terms of purpose, you, I mean, nearly every company has got a purpose statement and you find them in the reception halls and they look great. And um, when you ask people, you don't get a sense of what it means. Yeah. And, and that's the disconnect. And so making the connection between all the strategic work and, and, and what's happening in, in the real life and in those behaviors, I think, is the most, uh, most critical uh, thing. And when you're looking through the book, <coughs> There's, 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 there's many great examples, and, and I've looked at companies that have been around for 100 years or more, mm -hmm. and some that have only been around for like 10, 20, uh, 25 uh, years. And they're both interesting to, to, uh, to, to, to study because of the companies that have been around, similar to Bentley, th there, there isn't a company that has been successful for 100 years straight. Yeah. So there's Hilton, uh, great example, I mean, they were, at the end of their dreams in, in 2004. They've turned it around since 2007 and did something similar to what Adrian just described in terms of the dream factor, uh, factory. They just uh, made sure, I mean, they did a lot of things, but one of the things that they did was they made sure that everybody who works in a Hilton uh, hotel has got uh, spaces for them that feel like the lounge for the guests, for, for the actual, actual uh, customers. And, uh, and again, I think to the point that um, we were just talking about in terms of when, you, when a business gets into very difficult um, um, situations and, and, and people have to leave, mm. um, probably one of the biggest um, departure stories that happened through COVID was in the hospitality uh, space yeah. as well. So Airbnb uh, had to let uh, go 1,600 people, which was pretty much 25% of their uh, total uh, staff. I'm not sure who in this room have, has, has heard about that because they've managed it very, yeah. very yeah. Um, well. And it's all been linked back to the purpose. And they've done similar things that, that, that you've done and, and many more. And so the, uh, the way you manage it is critical uh, to everything. And it's, it's not just for those that leave, it's also for those that stay. Because, I mean, they all know their colleague who had to go, and usually people don't feel good about it. So you have to balance uh, yeah. both. And then you look at situations like better.com or P&O uh, here. Phew, it's exactly. Just, you, and you can see it, can't you? So I, you yeah. know, I'd, I'd add 
probably British Airways to that as well. I think they do some great things. You know, it's mm -hmm. a brand that's endured for a long time, but they didn't behave brilliantly at the beginning mm -hmm. of lockdown. And, you know, they're really struggling with people. And mm -hmm. you can see and you can hear it. You just have to walk into the organization and you can sense that it's not all, all great at every yes. level. And that's, you know, such a shame, mm -hmm. isn't it? That sort of the last one, that sort of sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. You know, again, we've talked about the behavior. We've talked about you know, what does it really mean to belong to Bentley Motors? And not just now, but kind of in the future. Where's that vision going? I think um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, we talk about diversity and inclusion uh, as a key theme nowadays. All of us do. Um, but I think as well as that purpose and having a role to play, there is a constant need for reinforcement of inclusion and that sense of belonging. Mm. Um, so we, we've got some very operational things that we do that are also inspirational, like we have our long service awards. We just did two nights in a row last week. Uh, people who's, with, who's been there the longest? Um, well, he's still there. 61 years is the longest wow. serving. That's amazing. Um, but the, the 25 or 40 years, this particular celebration, 300 people. Because uh, we didn't do one in 20, we do it every two what, years. So you've got 300 people that have yeah. been there for 25? 20 or 25 or 40 years, yeah. No, there's way more than that, but that's only the ones that were in this window. Yeah. Wow. So it's probably about 900 in total. So we, we celebrate it. We can't give them watches and stuff anymore because of compliance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but they party and they love it. Then they tell everybody about it. We've done two days at Alton Park this week with 500 people. We're going to take the rest before the end of September. Track cars, vintage cars, off-road course, no matter what you do, sweep the floor, run the company, you get the chance to go. But the, the most important thing is we constantly tell people what we're doing. When it's good, we explain. When it's bad, we explain even more. Uh, we ask for participation. And when anything goes wrong, we immediately think of people first. And there's, there's nothing conflicting about going people first in a business situation. But when you do, and you keep doing it, it builds trust. Yeah. So that sense of belonging, there will be people, there are people definitely, who don't feel like they're part of the company. Or sorry, they, they don't feel fully part of the company. Mm -hmm. But we embrace a diversity. Yeah. We have a diversity day every six months, an Earth Day every six, mo six months, and a, a well-being day every six months, where everybody stops and does stuff. Yeah. And they reflect. And... Um, that is, especially the environmental stuff as well, is completely changed the way that people operate and released energy that we didn't know we have. Talking about the way we feel at work or feel it in the new hybrid working ways, etc. Yeah. And we've changed even office layouts, working patterns, everything beyond the, the requirement for COVID, etc. because of these inputs. Yeah. So we're constantly trying to make the company more human-centered, easy to work in and more effective for people and that helps with that belonging. I, I love the fact that you talk about particularly diversity and Earth Day and well-being, of mm. course, because that's really interesting. Do, by focusing on it once every six months, mm. does that mean it's only important then? Or how do you then push it through the organization all the time? So we have, on diversity and inclusion, for example, we have six networks uh, with different interests that run constant activity. Um, and they're, they're all well supported and they all do different things. You know, they all have their own event schedule. But we also ensure that that has now shaped the way that we attract, recruit and retain people. So there's five pillars of activity that we put in place that, that go all the way f through from reaching out through LinkedIn and through universities to the younger generation to show what kind of a place and community that we are and what we stand for right the way through to helping people in the company that maybe have the talent but they're not confident enough or feel that they're being suppressed. Yeah. Help them to get through because they need a bit more encouragement than the bullish yeah. alphas that can do it naturally. Um, <laughs> and we, we, we also bring in characters to help to personify that right. um, and participate with us. So we take it seriously. Brilliant, Brilliant. gosh, and, I, and it's, you know, that we've had people all day talking about this because it, because that's what the day is about but it's brilliant to hear you know what feels like it could be quite an old automotive type of business sure. do this kind of thing it's mm. you know it's, it's fantastic 
Um, if anyone's got a question, if they shove their hand up, I can look at it and I'm going to come back to it after I've asked Ralph to just, you know, talk us through the key themes from your book, from your understanding and knowledge and experience around belonging. Because I still think it's brilliant to hear examples, but give us a little bit of a granular, you know, understanding of it. There's been this wonderful McKinsey study that was shared last October, and this was about the great resignation yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and all the key reasons. And why, why, why it's been a great study, a great survey, is because they looked at both ends of the spectrum. They've asked employers, why do, you th do they think people leave? And they asked employees why they're leaving. Mm. And it couldn't be more black and white. So the employers say, well, they got more money somewhere, or a job promotion, or perhaps there are health issues and they got to leave. And the employees basically say, I've got no sense of belonging here. I'm not feeling valued by the organization, and I'm not feeling valued by my manager. So that's black and white uh, as it can get. And <clears throat> so companies thinking about that level of uh, belonging, uh, often you hear, oh, yeah, well, well, it's not just feel good. And of course, it's not just feel good. Business is not just about feel, feeling good. But it's about taking care of and taking taking the responsibility that that businesses have for for their, their uh, for their empl employees and you look at lego for instance um, if you research data on on lego one thing you will find is a hundred percent score on i'm proud to be working in this company a hundred percent is unbelievable. Wow. Similar is LinkedIn um, on, on Glassdoor. Uh, Jeff Wiener was the only CEO who mm. ever got a hundred percent approval rate. So companies that focus uh, uh, on exactly those elements are really, really critical. And, and LinkedIn to me is a great example because they're one of those companies that uh, also look at spirit. So they got their, their vision and their mission and their values sorted, but they also had a spirit um, discussion about how do we want this place to feel? Yeah. And that creates the belonging. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it's great. And the great examples. We've got a question, I think, just up the back. Matt, I think, is going to give um, a microphone to someone who wanted to ask a question. You have a question? No questions. Yeah. No. Anyone? Oh, my gosh. Oh, there's one just down here. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Hi there, thank you very much for this discussion. Um, I'd love to ask Ralph, uh, where did you come, why did you come up with the, the, the term soul? What was the inspiration for, for choosing that term? I read an article in, in the Harvard Business uh, Review by um, Ranjay Gulati, and he uh, had written this article, which, he talk, which was headlined, The Soul of a Startup, and he was talking about the innate energy uh, inside a startup, and, and I thought that captured it very well. But actually, I believe that this is not just limited to startups. Startups obviously have the um, the, the advantage uh, of, of being a founder-led business, and that makes it easier, especially for the first generation. Um, but the challenge obviously comes when you scale, and uh, when you're able to deliver that kind of environment for the culture to emerge and to be um, to have the integrity between what you say and what you, uh, what you do, I think any company can, can actually do that. And, and, and lots of tech companies, I think, have, have demonstrated very, very well um, to do that perfectly. Yeah, great question. Thank you very much for that. Uh, one more quick one here. PC in the middle. <coughs> Thank you, Peter. Adrian, I'm struck by the age of your workforce. Um, and I'll pro I can positively, I can imagine the craftspeople because you know, I've been around the Bentley factory a couple of times, and I, you could feel that. But as you make change, older people who have been there a long time are the most challenging. How did you get them on board to feel fresh and? open-minded for change? Yeah, lovely question. Um, yeah, good question. So first of all, um, it is about 800 people now that we have in this 25 to 40, well, 25 plus year service level. If I go back to 2018, that was about 1800. Ah. 
Um, so there's been, a, if, if you look at the demographic, it, there's a definite baby boom effect and there's a, there's a huge drop off. So if you walked into the company now compared with 2018, it just looks totally different. A, a great example is I left 15 years ago. When I came back in 2018, I still recognized most of the management team. Now they've all changed. And the people that are left, you'd be surprised how many people are in other functions other than the craftsmanship side because on the craftsmanship side, there's a lot of fresh talent that is coming to help us there. But I think the, the age question is, is not a factor when it comes to um, setting direction and a compelling need for change. Everybody's participated. And now I'm not saying that everybody feels totally um, included and belonging in, in the company. There's always some degree of... Um, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but you know, on, on mass, I've, I've, I've not worked in an organization um, that is as quick to respond to a challenge and to deliver against it than this one. So heaven knows what we'd be like if um, we had even less people with 25 to 40 years experience. Uh, and let's just say it's not always those that, that are more resistant. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, but you also probably have a situation where those people that have been around for a long, long time have a lot of pride with the organization. And if the business is in, yeah. in, a, in a bad situation, they want to fix and it, they want to fix it and, and, and bring back the pride. Yeah. And I think that's something that is so important to create that sense of belonging because everybody then has also a role to be part of the fixing and I think that's the best thing that can happen. Yeah you're right and that sort of sense of bring back the pride to an organization and certainly the pride that we have now I think again in in Bentley with a business that's growing again yep. uh, is is what we can all benefit from but you obviously as the leader need to happen anyway. Uh, thank you both very much I'm sorry thank we're you. completely out of time thank you for those questions. Um, I think for me I love the idea of corporate soul Purpose is our seventh let's reset need um, in, the, in the needs of well-being and performance. And we can see by just kind of dissecting what soul means, how it links into an organization, um, just the difference that it can make. Mm. It's lovely to hear it brought to life through Bentley and some of your examples as well, Ralph. Thank you very much. Um, this is the book. Buy it on Amazon. Go and talk to Ralph. He can sort you out with a book. Um, but uh, do read it because there's some really fantastic examples in here of some ways that you can think about it for your organization as well. Thank you very much for uh, the session. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.